talked about health equity and worked to ensure that everyone has access to basic health um, regardless of your social economic status. Tosi is also a coach who has helped and still helps people live effective lives. Um, everyone this evening, I want to um, I want you to welcome with me Dr. Tosi Olaluwoye as he presents his session on becoming better um, health professionals. Dr. Tosi, you're welcome again. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I must say. Um, I have a tendency this morning to, I just did, I have a tendency to, can, can you, can you, can everyone hear me? Just um, yeah, say that. Yeah. yeah All right. Um, I have a tendency to, I was just about saying I have a tendency to refer to the time as morning. And I actually just did that because um, it's, um, it's somewhere around, 204 right now in the morning so um so if i if i switch um that sort of time of the day kind of thing please just um bear with me but i meant to say good evening good evening to everyone and thanks so much inka for having me here um i appreciate the opportunity i usually do not take things like this for granted and i really do not take it for granted i was thinking i, I was going to see people's faces and then i realized that i was the only one until now that um, <laughs> that was on video so well i mean um so i think i'll just stay uh i think it's 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 okay for people to see who is talking to them and um right. All right, so I'm just going to get into it. I, I think I was supposed to start at 2.05, so I'm, I'm guessing I have an extra 10 minutes, or is this going to be tough? All right, um, so uh, I suppose this um, evening we have um, a good combination of different health professionals, um, ranging from doctors to nurses to um lab scientists, pharmacists, and um, whatever different roles people hold in the health sector. And um, the, the job I have to do this evening really is to talk to us about how to become better, what I think about how people can become better health practitioners. Um, and for me, really, becoming better practitioners is really most of the time a combination of what you know and what you actually do. But I usually like to say that it's even more of what you do with what you know than what you actually know. Because I, I, I'll give an example of that. You know, I have this. Um, so this evening, I'm just going to be sharing a few points and um um, a few a few thoughts that I have, and I'll just you know back a lot of them with e examples. Yeah. So and the reason I said it's really about what you do with what you know was because um, I I used to have you know when I was in in, in med school. By the way, I mean like I said earlier I finished from Labs here in Banjo University, um, and when I was in med school then I used to have you know I have a lot of friends that. Um, we used to we use the word stuffy like the the new stuff they know stuff they know you know so much about this medicine thing and when you when you at times you can you know there, there, there's something we say people are moving stuff and you know you hear things like give me 10 courses of this 10 differentials of that 20 courses of that and those people are always you know super excited to move all of those stuff but I realized that when we left school and got into practice, a lot of them became doctors that people didn't want to see. Like a lot of them, I, I actually heard of a lot of them that, you know, had interactions with doctors, I mean, with patients, and patients didn't want to go back to them. Not because they were not good, but because of what they did with what they knew. So, because um, at the end of the day, a lot of the things they were doing were not leading to, you know, results. Now, as much as it is important, and now we'll talk about that, to get knowledge and skill, I actually think that the things that you do with what you know matters way more 
than what you know. So um, the first thing I would say this morning that I think I think my glasses is reflecting, so I, I'll take it off. Um, I can manage to see without it, so but I think I can see a reflection on it. So um, so I'll just take it off. I think it's probably better this way. All right. So um, the first thing that I will talk about is and again, I've mentioned earlier that it's more about the things you do. And so a lot of things that I would say would actually jet towards helping us do better. And um, just as part of my introduction, while it is not my job really this evening to talk mostly about the, the, the entrepreneurship part of things, I know that there are better qualified people to talk about that coming up this evening. And I can assure you, you should look forward to that. It's going to be an exciting session. People are coming up um, to talk about this. But um, towards the end of my uh, my presentation, I'll just double into that a little bit, what I think about it, and just say a few things and run out of the space for uh, people that are better qualified to talk about that. So the first thing I want to say is that um, as health practitioners, you need to know that all lives matter and that you play an important role in the sustenance of their lives. Now, um, there's this popular Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, which I mean, I'm sure we've all heard about and all of that, which of course I believe in. But, um, and I think that's the word that, that rings, you know, when you say all life matters and all of that. Now, I personally think that, um, I mean, from, from, um, the few things that were said about my during uh, when Inca was reading sort of my profile the other time, my own passion, one of my own core passions is the fact that I believe that everybody should have equal or at least good access to health care. Now, I think it is important for all health practitioners to understand that the lives of everybody actually does matter regardless particularly of their socioeconomic status now what i've found with my practice in africa and i think almost everybody here would be able to um if you have worked in africa or if you are working in africa will be able to attest to the fact that people tend to enjoy privileges people tend to enjoy better attention from doctors from nurses if they have you know certain socioeconomic status such that some people are in some way denied certain opportunities, maybe because of what they do not have. But if as a doctor you're going to, or as a nurse, or as a, as a lab scientist, you're going to deliver good health service to people, you need to understand that the lives of everybody, you need to, that, that, that consciousness has to be set in your memory that the lives of everybody you are dealing with, everybody you come across, the lives actually matter and that you play a major role. Now, there's this analogy that I always like to bring up when I talk about things like this. You know, um, if you have an hospital or if you're working in, a, in an hospital and in that hospital for a whole year, you maybe see 100 patients. And at the end of the year, you lose just one patient. Now, if you're doing like an annual audit or annual report of whatever you have done that year, I'm sure at the end of the year, everybody in the hospital is going to come together and clap and be like, oh, we had a good year this time. Why? Because we had um, maybe at the end of the year, like I said, you lost just one person. Everybody's going to come together and be like, oh, we lost just one person. And that is one percent mortality, as we call it. But do you understand that, fine, that, that person that died was 1% mortality to the hospital. But there is a need to understand that that 1% mortality was somebody's father. That 1% mortality was somebody's mother or somebody's child. And when that person is taken away from them, it is not regarded as 1% mortality to them. It is to them 100% mortality. And so that consciousness was one of the things I had very early in med school. And 
Okay, so that, that consciousness is one of the things I had very early when I was finishing med school that guided a lot of my practice. And I think it is important that as health professionals, we understand. I'm going to share a little story of a, a, a pretty sad story. When I was doing my um, my internship, uh, um, I at a point I became, there's something we call the, the, the head of house officers or something like that senior house officer the senior house officer was supposed to be the head of house officers and then that morning somebody came and you know, gave me a call and was like two senior house officers needed to go on strike that a doctor has been beaten and i was like oh why would we be going on strike now i'm not much of a strike kind of person uh but of course at the same time i hate violence i don't believe that health practitioners need to be beaten but I decided to probe, I decided to ask a question and I was like, okay, so why was this doctor beaten before we even, you know, take any irrational act or something like that? And when I started investigating, I found out that this doctor, my colleague, was on call that night. He, but he decided to bring a girl to the call, I mean, to the call room. And so they were in the call room together. And um, as if that was not bad enough, they, bring, they brought in a patient for him to see. And they came to call him several times. But this guy just felt, oh, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And after like two hours, the guy showed up. But by the time he was showing up, the little girl was dead. And it was so sad. You know, this guy was just, it was just supposed to be a normal thing. Like, well, people die once in a while like that. But one thing about that particular patient was that she was the lead, the only child of her parents. And so for that family, it was 100% mortality. And she was not just the only child of the parent. She was a product of eight years of infertility. So they had looked for a child for eight years. And because of somebody's like a desk, because somebody needed, you know, to be with a woman when they were supposed to be on call, they lost their child and i'm like okay you i don't so much i mean definitely i don't like violence i don't support the fact that anybody needs to be beaten but i'm like i mean go forbid if it was my own child how would i react will i go on strike for things like this do you understand what i'm saying so i think it's important to understand that and i think you should allow that you know um there's this tendency to say oh well i'm not seeing the patient i'm a lab scientist uh, all my work is just in the lab. I just need to write results. But you need to understand that there are times you write results and the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists are going to take decisions based on the results you write. And if you have done something maybe out of error, I mean, out of anything, if anything has impeded your judgments in any way, it will one way or the other tell on the patient. And so it is important that you do what? Understand that, look, for every case that I treat, for every patient that I nurse, for every lab result that I treat, I need to give my best. I think it's important to say that at the back of our minds, that I always need to give, uh, give my best as though the life of this person depends on me. And I'm going to share another story sometime later that will make you understand how well people's lives might actually depend on on you and people's happiness might depend on you i'll definitely share that story when i get to one of the other points i want to talk about the other thing obviously is that there's a need to get necessary knowledge now while i said it is more about what you do than what you know it doesn't negate the fact that you need to know your stuff you need to you need to read um a lot of people i i used to know a doctor then that uh, as a matter of fact, it was my senior colleague, but I hated doing calls with him. Why? Because whenever I did calls with him, if I ran into any trouble, I was on my own. I needed to sort myself out. Why? Because this guy had not read in years. He didn't bother like reading anything after med school and all that. But if you are going to be a good practitioner, there is a need for you to keep updating yourself, you know, keep improving your skill. As a matter of fact, there was this place I worked in Nigeria that one of the main reasons I got the job was because I was, excuse me, I was able to do ultrasound scan. You know, while, I mean, one would have said, oh, that's the work of a radiologist or a radiographer or whatever. But I decided to get that knowledge. And with that, I was able to get a job. 
and I saved the guy a lot of money because he used to send his can for pregnant women to, I mean, people, I mean, other facilities and all that. So apologies to all radiographers in the house. I know I might have taken your job at that time. But, you know, I was helping my boss and we're getting results and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing, we're able to manage our patient a lot better. And, you know, just... um. Sorry, I'm sharing a bit of sad stories like that, but I'll share another very not too nice story. Uh, a doctor that I used to know um, saw a patient and and um, it was in the accidents and emergency. He was doing an A and E call that day, and they brought in a patient, and this guy made a diagnosis. Apologies to um, and I I know I'm probably going to confuse you a little bit here. Now, I made a diagnosis of heart failure, and when he made that diagnosis fine it was good i mean perfect it took a good history and all of that but he made a diagnosis of heart failure and then to manage the patient he wrote something in the line of um normal saline 500 mil start and repeats every 500 mils every three hours and all that and of course in the next 30 minutes or thereabout the patient was dead and when the patient died, um, he started praying that this patient would not die. In the, I mean, he was praying and all of that. But the truth is that he just did the wrong thing. Like, everybody knows that if you have a heart patient, a heart patient with heart failure, the first thing you want, as a matter of fact, uh, when, when we were in med school then, they usually tell us, and I'm sure we all know in this room, that if you get into a ward and you see a patient sitting and go 45 degrees, no fluid on, Without reading the case note, you should guess that the person has that fluid. You don't give them fluid, you know. So, but this person, for some reasons, obviously because he didn't know, and he is a doctor, you know. So, the things you don't know at times, you know, can actually cause trouble for your patients. And so, it is important. And by the way, I worked with this excellent nurse. Um, um, I, I so much love and appreciate nurses. I really do. But this one actually has a special place in my heart. She was an old woman, like an elderly woman, sort of should be in her fifties or thereabout. But I have if I I have never seen um I've I've never I've not seen too many more intelligent people. Like she's taking part in the world rounds with us. And while we're trying to like have conversations about what can be wrong with this patient, she's bringing up ideas that even at times we are looking like, okay. Thank you for sharing that. But you know, she has a lot of knowledge. You might think, oh, my work is just, um, I'm just the radiographer. But do you know that the little extra information that you give may be what the doctor will use to make important decisions that will save a person's life? And don't forget, I've said earlier that you have a major role for every case that you treat. You need to treat it as though you um, the, the person's life or, or yeah, life depends on the decision that I take right now. And I'll just add, in addition to that, that while you have enough skill, which will be my third point now, you need to be humble enough to know. Now, this is where a lot of health professionals get it wrong. You need to be humble enough to know when to pass things on. You need to be humble enough to know what your limitations are. I know a lot of people don't want their patients to, you know, I was having that conversation on Twitter the other day. A lot of people don't want their patients to know that, um, how would they know that I don't know that? How would they know that I don't? But the truth is that you're not, you're not, um, you're not omniscient. You don't know everything. You can't know everything. There is actually no one that knows everything. And so it is important for the sake. I think for me, you are a better health practitioner if you know your limits. If you know the things that you don't know and you are able to pass it on to other people. The role, the, the goal of being a, um, a medical practitioner is not for you to show off. There's a need for us to understand that. It's not... The, the, the what makes you a good health practitioner and if, if there is no if you're not going to take anything out of this I think you should take this what makes you a good health practitioner is not the fact that the patient knows that you 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 know your stuff but the fact that the patient goes home healed and hearty the fact that the patient comes to you and you are able to give your best such that 
if that person dies or if anything happens dead or disability it is a matter of okay there was nothing else that could have happened but you've done everything that you could do and everything that you could do at times could actually mean referring the patient so you should know your you should know your limit and be humble, be humble enough to pass things on all right the fourth thing i would like to say i'm just i just realized that i've been talking for like 20 minutes or there about and that means my time is you know slowly running and so i'll just try to now the next thing i want to talk about is the need to pay attention to details um and again this will come to the point uh, to what i've said earlier that it is important that you know that you play a major role in the sustenance of lives of other people. Don't forget, losing one patient may be 1% mortality to you, but it is 100% mortality to the client. And, you know, I, 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 this story vividly comes to mind um, where I was, uh, when I, again, this was back where I was doing my housemanship. Um, it was in the pediatric ward. And we had a ward round that morning. Um, and then where you know the way they like to do ward rounds the my the, the senior colleagues then they just walk around and grab the case notes okay look at the what is on the whatever whatever okay everything looks fine patient can go home. and or continue management and all of that people weren't so keen on thorough review by the way i have a friend who does that i, I always say that there is no I, I wouldn't do a call with with like i would choose to do a call with him more than any other person simply because he pays attention to details very important to pay attention to details you know there was this so there was this day we're having that call and um we're, we're doing that word run and it, that one of my senior colleagues came in and saw the patient and was like you know he just picked up the case file looked at the lab results and said well, one of the, the patients looked well, but one of the things we were managing the patient for was um, anemia, low blood um, level. And so the guy just looked at that and was like, okay, PCV came out to be 32 or thereabouts. And I was like, oh, this patient can go. So he just said um, discharge. So while one of the one of my colleagues was trying to write, you know, the discharge notes, I just looked at the patient, you know, and I was like, chief. Um, so most of the time, what we call senior colleagues is chief. So I was like, chief, come and look at this patient. This patient doesn't look like someone that has a PCV of 32 degrees. This patient looks pale to me. The, I mean, you could see pallor all over the place. And the guy now came back and was like, okay, let's send this to the lab again. We took blood sample and we sent to the lab. This was not a sickle cell patient. The result came out a PCV of 12 degrees. The other one was done overnight, but because of lab error, which of course can happen. Um, I mean, there are lab errors everywhere. There are errors in judgment, clinical judgment. I mean, doctors, we, we all, I mean, everybody can make mistakes once in a while. So, but of course that does not mean that people should keep making mistakes. But because of that error that day, we could have just discharged that patient. If you don't pay attention to details, you can just look at that. Oh, that PCV is um, 32%. The child can go home. And then you send the child home. And maybe later in the evening, the patient is brought in dead or something like that. Because, I mean, I, I don't, someone who is not anemic and doesn't have any other, you know, blood issues like that, going home with PCV of 20%. I'm somebody who is not a sickle cell, going home with PCV of 12, 12% is pretty dangerous. And so, but if not for that, you know, little attention of, okay, let me just have a look. Look, again, don't forget that the most important thing is for you to give your best to your client. It's not just about, it's not going to be about, because I remember one of those periods, that, that particular um, doctor, senior colleague told me, was trying to tell me that, um, Tosi, can we, can we go out and, you know, just hang out and, you know, just flex a little. And in my mind, I was like, look, we're supposed to be at work. Chief, I'm not going out. I'm not flexing, you know. So I just have this impression that maybe it was one of those days he wanted to flex. But your work is not about flexing. Your work is about paying attention to details. As a lab scientist, your work is about um, having that sample, 
looking at the sample, be sure, take that little extra minute. As a matter of fact, I stopped working in the particular hospital because they were always rushing me. You know, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be sitting, seeing a patient, and once you spend more than five minutes on a particular patient, the admin officer comes to the door and starts doing, starts doing like that for you. And at the point, I felt, no, I can't take this anymore. And I just said, okay, I was resigning and I left. Because you tend to lose lives that way. It is important that you pay attention to details. Don't forget, 100% mortality, 1% mortality. And the next thing which I will think, um, I have just two more points to share and then I'll be done. The next thing which I think is, will be the sort of the most important of all the things that I have to say this evening is um, the fact that you need to show empathy. There's no way you're going to be a good health practitioner if you do not show empathy. You're going to have to treat the person as though they were your own family member, as though they were somebody very close to you. Um, you know, yesterday I was I was talking to my mom. She was she she had some you know little health issues like that, and we were talking on we were discussing. If I we've been talking about it for the past three days, and each time she was talking, I leave my work to sit down to listen to her. Now the question is, how many patients would I be able to do that with? But that is the sort of mentality that now I'm not saying you should take the whole of the world. I mean, to attend to patients and all that, we need to be smart about it. But at the same time, we need to give our best. We need to, and giving our best would actually involve what um, showing empathy. And this empathy, I, I will share, I think this will be my final story. I will share a story, something that happened to me, that if you ask me what has been my best moment as a medical practitioner, this will be it. And what happened was, I was on call that day, medical ward, and we had this patient who was, um, who was bleeding. Uh, the, the bleeding was from the gastrointestinal tract and it was breathing really bad uh, to the point that we had to transfuse him and he was having serious pain. We were actually managing him for uh, PUD at that time, but the pain was really bad. So um, we're giving him the normal um, the PUD medications, but at the same time, they were giving him um, um, painkillers and all of that. So I remember they gave the, we were transfusing him and we're transfusing the other person beside him. But at the point he finished his own transfusion, but he started passing out fluid, like he just literally passed out all the blood and all of that, passed out a lot of fluid. And he was right there on the bed. He was in severe pain. And so I got called, however, the other patient beside him started having transfusion reaction. So I got called, I think I was in the a &E or something. I got called to come and see the patient that had transfusion reaction, which the nurses had actually provided, I mean, done a good job with. I mean, they'd, they'd stopped the reaction, giving all the necessary things, fantastic. So I came back to just to see the guy and, you know, to, because I always like to make sure I see, I don't just, I don't just um, leave my work undone. I want to be able to document and all that. So when I came in to see that other patient, the one by the bed, I saw that everything was fine. And then I went to the nurses. Uh, I, I was going to the nursing station. And then this guy called me. I was like, ah, doctor, I am in bad pain. And he was having that terrible pain. And I went to him. And I was like, okay, um... Mr. Whatever, look, I was trying to explain to him that we've given you our best. We've done a lot um, for your, for, I mean, in terms of painkillers. And that at this time, we cannot give you another one because we don't want to load you with um, too much medication and all of that. You know, this, the time spacing, we don't want to overdose you. And that was the word. But all I was even saying didn't even matter if eventually because all I needed to do while talking to that, you know, there was a tendency for me to talk to him with my hands in my pocket and be like, you know, and there's this other possibility that, hey, you got to stop crying now. You know, you are disturbing people in the world and all of that. But what I did that day was I went to the man and I held his hands 
and I was like, Mr. Susu so and so, you will, um, you know, I was just trying to explain that to him. I was try- because do you know that a lot of times the pain that people feel, a lot of them would actually be relieved if they have some some of psychological relief. So I was talking to him, and I held on to his hands. But what did I realize? Oh, that holding us on um, on to his hands was just to show him, which was something. Now I don't. Uh, I need to put a caveat here. It is important that. Um, we watch that, especially with the opposite gender. You don't want to do it in, in ways that you'll be accused of, you know, sexual abuse or sort of any form of abuse and all that. But, you know, even without holding people, this is really not about saying we need to start holding people. But there is just a way you relate with people that makes them feel important. So I went to that guy and I was, you know, I just held on to his hands and I was trying to explain but holding on to his hand, I realized something. The hand was cold. And that just sort of snapped a whatever in my brain. And I checked the other one, and the other one was cold. And the first thing that came to my mind was cold clammy extremities. And this guy, I mean, I just remember this guy has just been bleeding. And then I went for the pulse, and the pulse was literally non-existent now at that time the nurse was at the nursing station very wonderful people those particular set of nurses i love them but i don't know what happened to them that day they were just off color so they were literally sitting on their table and this guy was in you know and i was like i had to call the nurse and i was like can you come and help me check this purse maybe I'm not able to measure it properly and they came and where they put the answer was like doctor there's no pause the pulse was gone. The blood pressure, the systole was like 60. As in, if you have a systole of 60, it was, of course, immediately the old world was scattered. We got, you know, lines. I had to set the tango. They had a line on. I had to set another one. You know, the way we inflate um, um, normal slime, uh, whatever, and we start pumping and all of that. I had to, that was the most heroic moment I've ever had. I mean, you could see the old world was, the, the wife was already, there was a young man of about 30 something, the wife was already crying out there. Before you knew it, the guy was saying, Dr. Otin Remy, Otin Remy is like, I'm getting tired. And I was like, you cannot be tired. You know, we just have to like rush in the fluids and all of that. And at the end of the day, after the flu, of course, the patient was in shock. But how did I know that the patient was in shock? It was just a simple touch of empathy. Imagine I had tried to console him from a distance. So imagine I had shouted on him. What would have happened was that they would have, I would have gone out, and five minutes time, they would have called me to come and write the death certificate of that man. And I would have come, I would have written in patient was apparently LD until so and so and I would have written out all of those nonsense and somebody would have lost a husband. Somebody would have lost a father. At the end of the day, I would have said assessment, um, clinically dead, plan, move to mortuary and I would have continued with my work. I would have continued saving the other lives but people would have gone home without a father. What saved the day that day was just a touch. It was just an issue of empathy. It was just a display that I cared about you. I once lost a patient. I once lost a patient. And when the son, the son was older than me, he came when he saw me and was telling me about because I was not on the world when the father died. When he came, he came to me, hugged me, put his head on my shoulder, and he was crying and was telling me how his father was gone. The reason he could do that was because when he came in, I mean, he came in with CVD, and, you know, we already told them that it was a 50-50 chance and all of that. But the way the patient actually died, but the way we managed the patient went a long way to tell the family that they care about us. So even when... You lose patients, you know that you've given your best to this particular patient. And there was another patient who actually was working with a boss like that, that, you know, that patient was obviously, as a matter of fact, at some point, they, they, 
the the other you know practitioners that I worked with at that time actually told me that Tosin, leave that man alone, he was going to die anyway. And I'm like, I can't imagine. Look, health practitioners cannot be that way. Doctors, nurses, pharmacists, you cannot be that way. I'm 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 this is this is really I'm I'm really passionate. You can't, you can't, you're not God. Even when you think, even when your clinical knowledge says that this person is likely to die, please and please, I am I'm appealing. Please just give that little extra effort and see what can be done. And the final thing I would say, because I think my time is fast spent, the final thing I would say is that a happy health professional is a good health professional. Um, most of the time, if you are not happy, if you have just sort of broken up with your girlfriend or your girlfriend has broken up with you, or if you don't have money and you're coming into the into the um, hospital sad, somebody has lost, you know, in the family and all that, you are not in a happy state. Chances are that you may not give your best to your clients. And so it's important if you're going to be good health practitioners that you look for a way for you yourself to stay happy, to be happy. A happy one, a good one, or sorry, a happy professional is a good health professional. And some of the things that you need to think about talking about happiness, number one, you actually need to ask yourself if you're in the right profession in the first place, if you're doing the right thing. Um, this, um, I w this is not part of today. Um, but I mean, this all comes to understanding your purpose, understanding your passion. Um, I decided to switch. While I love clinical practice so much, I realized that my passion was actually more into public health. My passion was actually more into epidemiology, which I could not pronounce. But <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's but that I mean, uh, for instance, when I went to um, when I was in East Africa, I was in the refugee camp, you know, taking data. I was climbing by. You needed to see pictures of me. I should have actually um, made pictures. I just put the pictures. I, I look so dirty. and But it was exciting for me. It was actually exciting. Um, I enjoyed myself. You actually need to be doing something you, you, you're excited about. Um, I, I, I stay in, in the theater for 10 hours. I've, I've done that before and it's it's not one of those things I want to keep. Sorry, you please, your voice is low. I can't hear you anymore, please. Okay, Um. what about now? Can you hear me? Hello, what about now? Let me see. Can you hear him now? I can hear you clearly. Dr. What about I now? Oh, okay. your voice is low. I can't hear anything from him. Okay, uh, I think it's it, it might be your network uh, messy because it, I, I can hear him clearly. Um, maybe you should just try to increase your I mean your volume from your laptop or your phone, but we can hear him clearly. Please go on, um, Doctor Tosi. All right, so um, so again that that's really going to come um come to how much do you enjoy what you're doing, and I think it's important for you to sort of ask questions about that. And the other thing I would say about making yourself happy is you need to live a balanced life have fun as in don't die in the hospital you, you don't need to die in the hospital have fun go on holidays refresh you know have have times of, I've, I've had two holidays this year and they were i think some some people might say i'm lazy how can you be having two holidays it's just july and with covid and all of that but i've had two wonderful holidays and coming back from my holidays i came back refreshed and if they i mean live a balanced life I mean, if you relate with people, relate with your family, you know, if you have a love life, relationship life, just ensure you live a balanced life because a lot of the things that you do outside of there somehow will reflect on how you um, manage or how you, what and what you do eventually. And the final thing I would say, this will sound a little bit, um, I can't even be talking like that, but it's important to have money have money now which i think is is the what we will be talking about um for the bulk of today and i think that's one of the reasons why a session like this and if you're going to have money let me tell you the truth whether you're a nurse you're a doctor you're a um i don't know what 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 you can be especially if you're practicing in nigeria nigeria will not pay you enough that's just the truth. Nigeria does not pay anybody enough. One of my nurse friends were telling me two days ago that um, nurses earn about 100,000 
during internship and all that. Look, that cannot sustain anything. Nigeria will not pay you enough. And so it's important that you start thinking outside of the box um, and create time to do your side also. Have a side also. Have something that you do. And some of those things, if I will say, and this is where I will end this, in this COVID and post-COVID era, uh, I know the other speakers that will be coming up will speak more to this. I know they are better prepared for that. But in this COVID and post-COVID era, everything you do in terms of um, your side also, as much as possible, make sure it is something that can be done um, digitally, if I might use that word. Make sure it's something that you have a part of it that you don't need to make contact with people. Um, I've been talking to my family um, about my family in Nigeria about diversifying their business. They have um, school businesses that require contact people, but school has been on, 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 on hold right now. And so it's like everything is just on hold. But I mean, they are thinking of something else right now. It's important, whatever you do, your phone should actually be something the truth is that a lot going forward from now, um, in Melbourne now, they've just they've just brought up a rule that we must all wear face masks. So if I'm leaving my house now, I wear face masks. The truth is that um, I'm, I don't want to sound like somebody that doesn't have faith. I know there are pastors and imams here, but the truth is that COVID might be with us for a, for a while. And um, so we might need to practice social distancing for a while. Churches will happen online. Um, Religious activities will happen online. Businesses need to happen online if you're going to be smart about it. I recently started doing stock and it's been pretty good. Things that you can do online, you really need to start thinking about those things. Things that can generate money for you when you sit in the comfort, uh, well, comfort or not of your house. You know, um, as of three months ago, I used to think that I was going to enjoy teaching, you know, and I actually started about no, not three months ago, about four or five months ago, just before the COVID. And after teaching for a while, I, I just thought for a, for a week on campus and they said everybody needed to move online. And life has been online there. I mean, since then, this is where I resume every morning. Like most mornings, I just sit in here, headphones. I, I basically taught the entire semester just the way I'm looking at you right now. Things are moving online. And so you need to begin to think about businesses that you can move online. And with that, I think I have been able to convince and not convince. That's just, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for listening. I'm so grateful. I appreciate If there are questions, I'm more than happy to take, um, depending on the number of minutes available. Amazing. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Kelsey. You know, like, like, I, like I said earlier, I could not pronounce that. You know, I have to use that against me, but that's fine. <laughs> you know, but that was, I mean, it was just very, very educative. You know, I from this session, I got quite a number of stuff that I, I have to go and research about because I don't know the meaning of those things. But I just want to know what they really are about. All right. So this was just so insightful for me and educative as well. And I believe that that is, that is also the same for those that are listening to this session right now. So in case you have, you have questions, like when, when Dr. Tosi was speaking, something that you very um, clear about or you need clarity about that he mentioned, you can please unmute your mic so you can ask your question now. It's, it's a good time to ask questions. We have just five more minutes for this session. So it's, uh, yeah, you can unmute your mic so you can ask your question now. So let's get to that now. Okay, I think we have someone who, hello. I, I can't see anyone raising their hands or trying to unmute their mic for questions. So um, I think we're just going to um, round up this session here. Dr. Tosin, are you staying with us at the end of the webinar? We are leaving now. Understood. So Dr. Tosin is, uh, you know, he has been speaking to us all the way from uh, Melbourne, um, Australia. So this is, okay, the time right there should be 3 a.m., I believe. So Dr. Tosin, you to go back to bed to sleep. So in case you have questions after now that is directed to his session or while he was speaking, you can send it to him later and then probably you'll be able to 
and revert to us on the question and we will get back to you. So thank you very much, Dr. Tosin, for that very educative session. And it's such a privilege to have you here on the Six Big Platform. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank we you. really, really appreciate thank you guys. Thank of the team and I. Thank you very much, Dr. Tosin. Yeah, thank you so much for listening, guys. I really appreciate your 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 time. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, hi everyone. I can see quite a number of um, people had um, joined us while Dr. Tosin was um, um, having his session. I see here Ridwan Abdul Ahmed. Hi Ridwan, how are you today? I see Oluwa Toyi Olai Yako. I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name well. I see Kate in from Akman. How are you, Kate? Uh, yeah, Kate, you reached out to me yesterday. Um, thank you very much. I see Dr. Samuel Yusuf. I see Okofo Ono Ezekiel. I see our job, Biolua So Thank you very much. I see Oiko Sola Oluna Ike. I see Marco Glory. Hi, Marco Glory. How are you? I see Messi Olamide Elerebe. Messi, can you hear us clearly now? So we can know what to do about that. You complained earlier that you couldn't hear us. Can you hear clearly? Hi, Messi. I see pharmacist Adasa, pharmacist Adiola. They will see you. Hey, it's good to see you, pharmacist. Thank you for coming. I see Oka Adimchi. I see Oluwa Damilola Adelego. I see Richard Adeola. I see Roslyn Ogunwale. Mercy, can you hear us? I see you, you, your mic is on. Can you hear us now? Are we clear? Yes, 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 I can. Awesome. Yes, I can. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. You're welcome. Thank you too for joining this session. All right. I, am, I, I hope we are following closely on all the sessions, you know, and we have more to come. We have Benedicta coming up now. So, Benedicta, are you there? This is me trying to confirm if you are here. Like I can see you, but can yes, you hear us? Yes, I am. Awesome. Good evening, awesome. everyone. Good evening, Benedicta. Good evening. Hello. Hello, I can hear you. Good evening, I can hear you. I can hear you as well, Benedicta. Good evening. Um, you can yes, hear you yes. Then? yes, I'm here. I'm here, Benedicta. I can see you now. Okay, okay. All right, I see more people joining in now. Thank you all for um, joining the session. It's such um, a joy to have you all here. So we'll be going right into Benedicta's session um, um, right now. Hello everyone. Please, can someone respond if they can hear me? I can hear you. Good evening. Okay. Benedicta, I can hear you. Please yes, hold on. Can you, can, you, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. All right. So I'm just going to um, read Benedicta's profile shortly um, while I bring her on um, fully. So Benedicta um, Ueru Apwama. Benedicta is a Bachelor of um, Pharmacy degree holder. Um, who is passionate about working in the Sustainable Development Goals SDG. She was a one champion 2017 and 2018 at 1.org in Nigeria. She represented one in Nigeria and Africa at the One Youth Summit in Brussels. She is the founder of Girls for Development Goals Foundation, formerly Girls Health and Education Foundation, GA. Utilizing the health SDG templates, especially for a, a project which, which include um, all of this. And she is a 2019 WYSE ILP Brazil alumni, being the only Nigerian delegate at the training that gathered 29 particip um, participants, I beg your pardon, <laughs> across 18 countries of the world in Sao Paulo, Brazil. She was a champ um, a chairperson at the just concluded. Um, Tanzania International Model for UN Conference 2019, and she continues to develop herself. She's a director on the board of Benny and Freddy, a private liability company that produces reusable sanitary pads and offers a variety of um, services. She organized the Youth Voices Conferences in commemoration of the 68th United Nations Civil Society Conference in Kirby State, August 2019. She also spoke at the Youth Empowerment and Development Conference in Abuja, Nigeria, where she engaged young people on how to access international platforms. 
She's currently the only female Nigerian ambassador for the Young Political Leadership School Africa, representing Nigeria in the sixth semester in Monrovia, Liberia, um, October 2019. I'm welcoming with me this evening, Benedicta. Benedicta, you're welcome. You can take the stage now. All right. Thank you so much. Good evening once Hi, again. Benedicta. Hello? All right. Thank yeah, you so much, clear. everyone. Your mic is clear. Okay, great. I'm You're really welcome. excited to be here. It, it's a pity um, Dr. Tosin has gone. I wanted to actually fight him a little bit for stealing some points from my notes. I don't know how he saw them. <laughs> Hello, we can All hear right. you. We can hear you. Okay. All right. So um, today I'm going to be talking about carving a niche outside the health sector. Um, from I, I joined in a little bit late, so I didn't follow Dr. Tosin from the beginning, but I did hear him talk about a lot of medical jargons. And I'm really excited to hear that I have some colleagues in the house. Hello, pharmacists. As men of honor. All right. So when um, I'm, I'm going to start with talking about what we are told in the medical school or in the pharmacy school versus what is obtainable in the real world. When I finished um, my school, I, I graduated from Delta State University, as you already heard from my profile in 2016. It took a year before I got inducted into the profession because my school of pharmacy was a young one and with all the challenges with accreditation. So I got inducted into the profession in 2017. And it took another one year before I could get internship placement. I was very, very upset because a lot of the challenges that I saw, my lecturers in school did not tell us that. They gave us the impression that once you graduate from the school of pharmacy, you come out as pharmacist. Oh. And everyone who hears you are a pharmacist, especially with as young as you are, they're going to worship the very ground you work on. <laughs> I came out and I realized it was not so. I was so upset. I wanted to go back to go fight them. Like, why didn't you tell us things were like this? And um, I'm glad that Dr. Tosin joined us from Melbourne. And he's still very in touch with the realities that we have in Nigeria, which is that Nigeria will not pay you enough. He talked about nurses being paid 100,000 during internship. I was paid 120,000 naira monthly during internship. And I was paid on the fourth month of starting. I mean, where do you expect me to get money for accommodation and all of that, especially in Utah? It took a whole year before I got inducted, before I, I got a place, a placement, you know, to eat intern. So I need us to prepare our minds. I, I, I don't know what our... My audience is like, but I'm sure we have a couple of medical practitioners here. I don't know if there are students. Um, Yinka, I thought you were saying something. Yes, 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 yes. We have a mixed, um, a mixed audience of pharmacy okay. doctors and um, yeah, all of that. Yes. Okay. So I, I remember when I. And when I graduated, I, I'm just going to take you through my journey from the plenty profile that you read and how I actually started, because I'm talking about carving a niche outside the health sector. I found out about community development projects, like you already heard from my profile, I'm very interested in, in work, working with NGOs in the public health sector, etc. When I started community development project, and I started working with, um, there's a friend of mine who is currently in Dubai, the UAE, and then every time we are preparing for a project or something, and then someone asks me to introduce myself, or I'm supposed to send my bio. The first thing I say is, I am a pharmacist. I didn't know that was getting him upset. <laughs> Until one day he asked me, Benita, can you just stop? Before anybody says anything, you already say you're a pharmacist. Nobody's taking that away from you. But apart from that, what else can you do? You say you're a pharmacist and you you can't write, you, you there are essay questions for applications, and then your writing doesn't even depict that you are a graduate. Talk more of being a pharmacist. And I was hurt. I was hurt, but he was actually right. 
apart from all the pharmaceutical jargons and um, passing exams and all the structures you have to draw in school, what else can you do? So I'm, I'm going to ask my colleagues who are here and even other members of the healthcare team who are here, if your license is taken away from you, what else can you do? Um, I'm actually glad because I, I listened into a little bit to Dr. Tosin and he, he spoke about how to be better health practitioners. I, I actually like that there is a balance in what you'll be hearing today. If you want to be in the health sector and practice, that is beautiful. But what stands you out from the next doctor? Some people get very shocked. Like, um, was it two days ago? I was having a conversation a couple of days ago with some volunteers from my organization. And then they came for a training. And, and then when we were going, they were asking me, um, so what's your background? And I tell me pharmacy. They're like, okay, I thought you were going to be in the pharmacy or in the hospital. So I started thinking. So my, my class, l let me talk about my school alone. Delta State University inducted, say, about 80 pharmacists one year. Let me just say one year, 80 pharmacists. And we're all in Delta States. Let's assume no one travels out of Delta States. If all of us decides to own pharmacy outlets, what is it going to be like? I mean, by the time you walk out your door, before you count two steps, there's a pharmacy there. Before you walk down the road, there's another one. What stands you out from the other person? I didn't know everything I know now. In fact, it might be shocking to you to know that I started what I started just after I graduated from school because I was too focused on passing my exams and not wanting to fail or spending an extra year in school. I was too focused trying to cram all my pharmacognosy notes or pharmaceutical chemistry lecture notes because I didn't want to spend an extra year in school. But when I came, I, I knew that I did, I, I wanted to be different from the other pharmacists out there. I knew I wanted something more than just being in a hospital. I told myself if I was going to be in a hospital, I, I wanted patients to queue and say, no, I want to see that pharmacist I saw that day. Or no, I want to see that doctor I saw that day because there was something outstanding, you know, when, when they came to me. And then um, in my final year, I attended this conference. For those of us who are pharmacists, you know, it's the, um, the Christian Arm um, National Fe uh, Fellowship of Christian Pharmacy Students, NFCPS. I attended the convention in UN and Sukha. And then one of the facilitators, who was a pharmacist, was talking about the Yali Network and the Mandela Washington Fellowship. I got so intrigued. And what he was hammering on was, I, am the only, I was the only pharmacist there. I was the only pharmacist there. And with the, I thought, well, I can also change the narrative in the health sector. I can actually carve a niche for myself outside of being a pharmacist. So even though I didn't understand everything completely, it was from there I actually met um, Yinka. We were on a group page together where we, I started to learn about community development projects. What, what Yinka and the others did not know was that at that time, I didn't even know what an NGO meant. <laughs> I'm sure she did not know that. I didn't even know what an NGO meant. I just wanted to learn. I remember I would take courses online and then run off to the next available um, secondary school to teach the young girls and the young boys there what I had learned. My mom was a, a school principal, so it was easy to start. I just spoke with my mom and said, Mom, please, I want to come to your school. So they said, okay. And then they told the, the, um, the head principal, you know, they have principal, vice principal. And they said, okay, you can come. That's how I started. I began learning on the job. That was when I knew, okay, there is a need in my community. I need to feel it. There are lots of girls who are getting pregnant in my community. What can I do to, to, to change that? So people who are listening, there is so much more that you can do other than being a health professional. There's so much more. There is so much more. I'm glad you already, you, we already know with the COVID-19 era, Apart from the fact that we are already in the fourth industrial revolution, there is, I mean, the practice now is very different. I'm sure a couple of years ago, there was nothing like having um, records on the system or even having to book appointments online before coming to the hospital. Now, all of that is changing. 
we need to open our minds to be able to embrace the other opportunities that are coming. And we already know that Nigeria will not pay you enough. What Dr. Dr. Tosin was talking about, um, health professionals being, being frustrated and um, being rude to patients or not caring enough. I'm sure most of those frustration comes with them not being paid enough. If you are not well paid and you are working your ass out, working long hours on your job, it's very likely you're going to get frustrated and not care enough about patients. So I have a few tips for you today. The first thing is identify a passion. What do you like? What, what are you good at? I know you want to pass your exams. I know you want to be a professor of, ph of pharmacy or a professor of medicine at 30 years, which I know is almost impossible. If that is taken away for you, from you, what else can you do? What else can you, can you do to sustain your family? Gone are the days where parents, usually when we're growing up, once they ask anybody in school, especially for the intelligent ones in class, what do you want to be? I want to be a doctor. I want to be, I want to be a nurse. I want to be an engineer. I want to be this. Times have changed. People don't care about what you study anymore. They want to know what can you do? What else can you bring to the table? If, you're, if you want to have a niche for yourself outside the health sector, you need to be humble enough to learn. That's another thing. Well, I'm a pharmacist. I spent five years in school. I had to go through internship. I had to go through this. Well, like I said, outside of what else can you do? You need to identify a passion. What are you good at? And not just identify the passion, you need to build on it. You need to have a game-changing plan. It's all right to start small. I started small and I'm, I'm still starting small. Amen. I know we're not in church. <laughs> I know I want to share with us some, some friends who I know. I know a medical doctor friend. We're in school together. When he was in medical school, I was in pharmacy school from the same university. Today he's a comedian. And you're wondering, what is a medical doctor doing being a comedian? That doesn't stop him from practicing if he wants to. Are we together? That, that doesn't stop him from doing what he wants to do. I know another medical doctor who is an artist. He's practicing. But let me give you an example of what he does. He's also interested in, in the NGO sector, the nonprofit um, sector, public health. What he does is since he's very good with art, he loves artworks. He goes to schools, speaks with the school head and say, OK, you have debts, you have rubbish all around. OK, um, I'm interested in, in um, advancing the UN SDGs. OK, so what I'm going to do is gather all the debts you have in your school, talk to the students, and then they make artworks out of these debts. They make so, so beautiful artwork, so, they are so beautiful that they can even sell them and make money. There is so much we can do in, at this time. Okay, let me not take you too far away for those who want to practice. Have you heard about Doctors Without Borders? I'm sure that doctor, what he'll be thinking of would, would not just be whether the patient is okay, he's thinking more on logistics. How many doctors can we recruit to, to do this medical um, um, outreach? How many doctors can... I mean, I was, I'm sorry to say, but we already know this, that our school system, especially the medical, um, the, the medical profession, it's not broad enough to expose us to what we're going to meet out there. It's, it's too one-sided. There are many sides to it. And then if you already left school, that is the, the responsibility you owe yourself to build yourself, to be able to thrive, all right? Another thing is not just um, working on passion. There is something you can also do to turn your passion into profit. To turn your passion into profit, I'm going to give an instance. Well, I started community development project well, and then I went on was doing projects, all I, I could think of was, well, I know that there is um, a future in what I'm doing. Well, at this time, let me not think of money yet. From my first project, I got 
selected by him to represent them in Europe, in Brussels. And it was uh, on my way back, I met Yinka for the first time, like physically. I remember she, she came to welcome me at the airport. It was so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. for that night and I began to apply on my own I can, if I can do this and get selected by an international organization for the first time I'll ever try that means there's actually prospect in what I'm doing and then I continued today my NGO is fully registered I am the director on board of a limited liability company I'm already thinking well these things I was doing for free there's a way I can actually turn it and then people can begin to pay me, even if I may start with, well, just 500 or 1,000, but I'll be gaining grounds gradually. It doesn't change the fact that I'm a pharmacist. It does not mean that tomorrow I cannot wake up and say, okay, well, I have to go back to practice, dust my license, begin to read again, to brush up, and then I'm back. I don't know whether we understand. During the COVID era, um, the, the lockdown, um, during the lockdown, it's important we all develop, before I go on to say what I want to say, it's important we develop IT skills. There is so much you can do with your phone. Let me shock you. All those trips and all the things that were read from my bio, I did not do them with a laptop. I did it with my Android phone. I did it by going to Google, the same way you Google other things. I did it by joining WhatsApp groups where they share opportunities. I did it by following some organizations on Facebook. What are you doing with your phone? So nowadays, there is no excuse of, um, eh, well, I don't have a laptop. There is no excuse. This meeting that we're having right now, I'm using my phone. As long as you have an Android phone, you don't have an excuse. There is so much you can do. So during the lockdown, I actually began to think, well, over the years, th this is like my fourth year in, in this space, and I began thinking, I can actually share some of these experiences, these things that people um, link me up for, oh, please, can you put me through this? Can you put me through that? I see a lot of people doing it and getting money from it, and they probably don't even know as much as I know, and they don't even have, have as much experience as I do. Why not start an online training Oh, and, and it wasn't that technical. It was just WhatsApp. I said, well, okay, I can train people for, say, three times in a week for a thousand naira. And that was how I started. And before you know, people started registering, people started coming in, people started coming in. Before eventually I, I got this job and then I had to slow down a little. So there is so much we can do. There is so much we can do outside your health sector. It's important you have money. In times like this, Dr. Tosin said that you have to have money for you to be refreshed. And for those people who, who want to be able to who want to stay in the health sector and practice, you need to be refreshed enough. So take off that frustration. You need to have enough money to afford the things that you want to buy. And you cannot do that by solely focusing on what you are doing. There has to be a side hustle. There has to be a side hustle. You have to be open to learn. You have to identify passions that you have and build on them. Okay, um, before we go on, I would like for someone to maybe respond. Sorry, because of the way it is, I, it's only in her face and stage. Can someone please just um, say something? Are you following? Do you have any questions? I really want it to be really interactive. So if you don't mind. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, following. Following. All right. Okay. I see Michael um, unmuted himself. Yeah, I'm here. You can go on. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm... Okay. Yeah, I'm following. I can hear you clearly. Thank you. All right. Please, do we have any questions? Because, you know, because yeah. of the audience we have. So I can hear you. Okay, great. Does anyone have any question, anything, any clarifications with? Okay. Hello? Hello? Yeah, does anyone have any question, please? Mm. 
so no, far, I don't please have please continue it. for now. We can hear you clearly. Continue. Okay. So we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, I will try to send you a bit of lens work in this, but I think it's going to get better. Oh, Benedicta, I can hear you clearly, and if you can hear me also, you can continue your session. All right. Thank you. Okay, so I have talked about identifying a passion. Um, Michael, Michael, please can you mute yourself? Please can you mute yourself, Michael? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I'm so sorry about it. Michael, can you please um mute your mic? It's really uh, distracting the class. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm glad we're following. Um, apart from the the points that I've mentioned before about finding a, a passion and then being able to turn your passion into profit. There are, there are other skills that I think that we can develop on. And then one of such skills is networking. Like I said before, these are things that we were not taught in med school. In fact, we, we have a, we, my, I, I feel like my class in school was very ex, uh, exceptional because we're very jovial, very friendly, you know, and very playful. But most times people in med school end up being nerds. They don't know how to network. They don't have friends in art class because they feel, well, we are the ethicals. We are the ones that read big test books and then um, learn for t take 14 courses for, the, for those of us who are pharmacists who take 14 courses in a semester you don't have a social life it's okay for you to pass your exams and all and be very serious with all your structures but there are skills that for you to be able to cut cut the PCN or PCN conference, you network with people. Who did you reach out to? Who did you walk up to? It, as, as little as what your interests are. Well, I have this idea and we don't know how to go about it. But who did you share with? How many post contact did you take? My husband is always beating me up about networking with people. Reaching out to people. You don't have to wait till when you have a need before reaching out to people. Let me share with you how I even got to know about the One Champions program in the first place. I mentioned the page that I joined. Richard, please can you mute yourself? Thank you. All right. I, I mentioned um, the the group page that I, I have been with, I've been on with Yinka for about four years now. I've been on that group page and the the heights that I have made today, the um, the way that I'm making today is because I've been able to network well. You don't have to be able to network with everybody. That's okay. But out of the hundreds of people on that group page, the person who even guided me through my first community development project, which was an, a campaign against teenage pregnancy in my community. As we speak right now, I am yet to meet that person one-on-one. -on -one. Of course, Ian Khan knows him very well. I'm talking about Mola. I am yet to meet him one-on-one. -on -one. But because of the way I was able to connect with him, he, he guided me step by step all the way. I told you when I started this, I didn't even know what the acronym NGO meant. I, I didn't know about it, but because I was open enough to say, well, apart from be, being a pharmacist, 
There are other things that I don't know that I need to be humble enough to learn. There are things that I don't know that I have to be humble enough to learn. I need to be humble enough to ask people. Are we together? And after guiding me through that project, he was the one who sent the, the, the application, the opening for the One Champions program. I applied, I ran everything through him. Did I answer it well? It's okay. We know they taught you how to report when a patient is pale and when a patient is sick or when a, a patient's temperature is high. Well, most of us, we were not taught how to write essays that would prove to people that this is your capability, this is what you can do or what you cannot do. We were not taught that in school. Maybe you were taught. I wasn't taught. All I was taught was to pass my clinical pharmacy exam. All I was taught was to, uh, to, to talk about my, my pharmaceutical microbiology exams and practicals, so reports practicals. In the real world, except you are working in, in, in the industry, you don't need that. I had to learn how to write. I had to pass my writings through a lot of people. Eventually, I got selected for this program. And it was like, it's like a new learning experience for me. I got there and I met people from different walks of life. I connected well enough with people. I networked well enough. So the point that I had people there who, when there's, a, when there's an opening, we're like, okay, I know um, Benedicta is interested in this and that. Then you can check this out. It didn't take up to six months that I joined one campaign that I was selected to represent them at a summit in Brussels. There were five of us who were selected. Eventually, I ended up being the only one going. Are we together? Networking skills is, is everything. Another thing that I want us to put in mind is volunteering. How many times have you done things for free? I know you are a doctor, and I know you are a pharmacist. I know you are a nurse. I know you are a professional. And you want to make money because obviously the government is not paying you well enough. Private practice is even worse. In fact, let me share an experience with you. While I was looking for in internship placement, I worked in a place in Abuja. I mean, Abuja of all places. And I was earning 15,000 Naira a month. That was not just it. There was no cleaner in that place. So they expect me to come every morning and sweep. It was very annoying. I was ashamed to tell my fellow classmates that I was earning 15,000 Naira a month. That was really frustrating. And then when, when I, I started my internship, I, I moved into the hospital. <laughs> I realized that the hospital practice was not meant for me. I was, I was so angry. And you know, the funny thing was, one of the things that, that drove me to, to want to become a pharmacist or a healthcare professional was, I thought hospital practice was it. I wanted to be able to build a bond with people, a professional relationship with people, such that a patient can work in confidently and conveniently. I want to open up to me and share things with me. I want to be able to walk through their, their treatment journey with them. But when I saw what was going on in, in, in the hospital, it was annoying. I couldn't stand it. I'm talking about even sometimes with, with respect to us pharmacists, sometimes we don't even support ourselves. One person is recounting the other the other person is, I mean, I just knew it wasn't, it wasn't for me and that I had to build on the skills that I already had. I know you want to make money in addition to what, you, to what the hospital is paying, is paying you for, but how many things have you done for free? I remember going on medical outreaches. In fact, uh, the second year where I was selected to represent a to be one of the one champions in Nigeria. We were sponsored to a training in Abuja. Thankfully, that was um, 2018. I was still... Oh, 2018. 
I was still on my internship, but there was I went to Abuja for the training. Let me tell you how this networking and the volunteering thing worked for me there. Do you know that while the training was brand enough, there was this medical team that was um, lodged in the same hotel, Medi Moses Lake Medical Team. Coincidentally, I'm wearing their shirt. Sorry, you can't see me now. <laughs> I'm wearing the shirt. And then they were going on a medical outreach to Kebi. I didn't know these people. Do you know Kebi says? Kebi is northern Nigeria. And we know all the stories we hear about. But what gave me confidence was if this thing from somebody else in the US to go on this outreach, then there has to be some really good security that will be available to them. So I thought, well, if I go to Kebi for this outreach, after, the, after my, my um, training has ended, they are going to take me there. I'm not paying for myself. They are going to pay for your transport. They are going to feed you, give you accommodation. It is the worst in the pharmacy world. I can do that. I followed people, total strangers. That was a risk. But because I knew what I wanted. Anyway, for everyone listening, my goal is to work with the UN, United Nations. So I'm not going to stop until I get there. Or, it, or any of these agencies, WHO, UNICEF. And see, I'm taking baby steps. I follow them, I, I mean, to a place I've never been. And of all places, not Western Nigeria. I go there and I go there. In fact, the very first day, over 300 persistent in the pharmacy, my body was in pain. Guess what? I was not paid. I was really I was. In, I went there to network. I met a pharmacy in other places. That's why I met um, the, the um, founder of Soho Health, and I met a couple of older people. I was lonely. I was lonely. And here's one of the persons I met there, uh, one of my programs that I was selected for to, um, to represent Nigeria in that way, he was not funded. I had to pay a program fee and then pay my essay, and it was quite expensive. But I knew really this is a good opportunity to start. So well, I, I need to find a way to raise this money. The highest donation I received from my school, or the highest sponsor I received. Um, I miss Benedicta. I'm kind of struggling to hear you. I don't know if it's the same for others. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you both. Not so clearly. Hello? Yes. Not so clearly. Try to speak louder. Okay. Hello? Okay. Not so clearly here, too. Okay, how about now? Um, no, 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 no. I can hear you, but it's very low. It's just very low. Yeah, it's low, very, very low. It seems like it's from a distance. Same, from a distance. Uh, can you hear me now? Oh, much better. Yes, yes, very well. Much better. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, I don't know what the last thing you heard is, but I said that the highest sponsorship or donation I got from that trip was from a network, a connection I had made at that volunteering program, at that medical outreach. And do you know that even though you don't get paid immediately for those services, they are going to pay you on the long run. NYC eventually posted me to the same state, Kebi State, to serve. And of course, your guess is as good as mine. I got one of the best hospitals to serve in, and I got one of the best accommodations in the whole state. Those are doors that networking and volunteering can open up to you. So another thing which you need to develop on, I've, I've touched it a little bit, is writing skills. 
Write, ask you to write cover letters. I'm making applications for these programs, for these international fellowships, and so on. When they ask you to write about yourself, these are things I don't know about you. I'm speaking for myself. I found them difficult. Well, maybe I could write a couple of things. I I didn't I I didn't know a thing about all about this kind of life i just felt once we graduate we're going to go either to the to the hospital to practice or to be in the industry or we're going to be uh, in the community outlets community pharmacy stocking our pharmaceutical shops with uh, medications and just like that so when you, you ask i'm asked questions about writing a short bio about myself to think okay i think i need a sample to do this how do i write a bio okay um and they're asking you why should we hire you or why should we be should we invite you for this program I mean, there are hundreds of people what stands you out from the others and i start thinking well the first thing i'm going to write is okay i'm a pharmacist i'm a medical doctor what if there are 100 medical doctors applying what stands you out from the others these are things you need to deliberately build yourself on writing and writing is not like one plus one two i've gotten it it's something you keep developing and you keep building yourselves on all right i've talked about just to recap i've talked about identifying a passion something you are good at i've talked about building yourself on it another thing i've talked about is how to turn these things into practice into profit i have talked about networking I've talked about writing skills and I've talked about volunteering. All right, so are we together? Yes. Yes, ma'am. We are together. Before I, I take your, your question, thank you. I want to round off by saying. It's all right to have big dreams. It's all right to have dreams that are bigger than you. And do you know the funny thing was um, when I was in tone level and then someone said, okay, in five years from now, where do you see yourself at? I just wrote, I want to be one of the most sought after pharmacists. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew, like I told you earlier on, that I wanted to be different from the others. I didn't know what it was going to be. But I sure knew I wanted to be better than other people. I, I wanted to be distinguished amongst many other pharmacists. They graduate 10,000 of us, 5,000 of us in the country every year. What stands you out from the others? Doctors, nurses, what stands you out from the next doctor? And do you know that those dreams that I had then, because I have gathered more information, because I have grown Beyond then, those dreams have changed. Those dreams are now bigger. If your dreams don't scare you, if your dreams don't stir you up to be better than you are already, they are probably not dreams in the first place. I'm a very big dreamer and an ambitious person, so I keep growing. I keep developing myself. I, I, well, okay, um, I'm the first um, female ambassador for the political one. one, one. Okay, that is good. What next can I do again? Well, okay, I've gotten this. That is great. What else can I do again? Because whether you like it or not, anywhere you are, there's someone who is better. There's someone who is better. So I'm going to end by again by saying it's all right to have big dreams. It's all right to celebrate your victories. It's all right for you to relax sometimes. Don't, don't push it too hard. All, all of these things or the, the dreams that you are, you are not saying in your mind will not happen in a day. Build yourself. Allow yourself grow. And before you know it, you're going to reach your goal. Thank you so much for listening in. 
I hope you found this section impactful. Please um, open to your questions now. Thank you very much, Benedict, for that session. You know, we started on this on the on the, on the scale where we had we had Dr. Tosin and he gave it, it started first of all because he gave us the foundation on becoming better health professionals and and better healthcare workers. You know, and I like um, the pace we are going now where we you know Benedict has has really emphasized you know, having a niche outside the health sector. Right. So if you have questions now, it's a good time to ask you. Um, you already mentioned that you can put your question in the chat box while we were having right while you were stopping the question in the chat box. So now you can unmute your mic and then quickly ask Benedicta your question. We have just five minutes for that and um, we, can, we can quickly do that now. So mute your mic if you have a question for Benedicta or a question that um, you want to ask. So, when he answered the session, you can put that down, you get the question across to you here. But right now, we want to ask Benedict questions. And yeah, so unmute your mic now so you can do that while we you know, start to um, get to the next session. Okay, so why take it that you don't have questions right now? But I, I don't see anyone raising their hands or trying to unmute their mic to ask some questions. So I believe probably would um, have this question at the end of all the sessions. So you can still drop your question and we we'll, we'll get right to it. So once again, thank you very much, Benedicta. That was very educative. Thank you for that really eye-opening session for um, individuals that are currently listening right now. You know, we have diverse um, people in, in the health sector right now listening to you. Or that to your session. Thank you so much. Very, 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 very insightful and eye-opening. Thank you so much, Benedicta. So I see that we, no one asked. There's a question for now. You don't have any question at, uh, at, at right now. So um, I believe we'll, we'll, we'll um, attend to the question later. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. On behalf Thank of you. Thank you very much, Benedicta. That was, that Thank was a you. Session. So, right, 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 right on to it. Um, you know, we, we had, um, like I mentioned, Dr. Tosin earlier, you know, it was really mind boggling. It, it broke down from myth, you know, um, with regards to the sector, you know, things that people have known and, you know, how to become, okay, essentially how to become better um, um, health workers and experts. You know, and, and it was just, I, I really wish that we were all there to listen to that. I hope you were there to listen to this session. And of course, Benedicta just, you know, wowed up all this, you know, all the, all the insightful things that she just brought up now. So moving up, moving right on to it, we're going right now to um, the next phase of the webinar. We have, um, we have Leah Rivera, we have Kristen um, Jay now. So um, can you, what can you, Jay, can you hear me? Leah, can you hear me please on mute your mic so I can be sure that you yes. can hear us? Or you can Can you All hear right, us? All right, great, great. So, yeah. Hi everyone. Hello. So, what, I so, I can't hear um Christian right now, but I can hear you clearly. Okay, perfect. Um we actually hi, have Christian, uh, can I hear you? Oh, oh hi. Yeah, can you hear Christian and Leah? Uh, okay, 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 okay. Can you guys hear us? It's great to have you both. Yeah. Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can yeah, hear you. we so can I'm hear gonna, you. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to read your profile shortly while, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll um, go straight right in, um, into it for you. So um, right now we have Leah Carrillo Rivera and Christian Rivera. Leah Carrillo Rivera is a wife, a mom of two kids. She's a former pediatric nurse and currently the CEO of Serenity Journal. Uh, plus Lana, Leah. Leah is a life coach and business consultant for North entrepreneurs who are looking to lead a less toxic life and turn their passions into profit. Kristen Rivera is a husband, a husband, father of two, former pediatric nurse and cardiac intensive care nurse who is now an entrepreneur in photography and business coaching. With, with aspirations in transitioning to becoming a motivational speaker. So the, um, today, right now, it's morning over there for you, but evening right here in Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria, we welcome you to um, the um, entrepreneurship webinar. You can 
can have this stage now. Thank you very much, Kristen and Leah. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, should we turn on our video or should we leave our video off? No, you can turn on the video. The video is fine. Okay. Yeah. It's fine. Right. Just so that you guys can Hello, see can us. you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We can see you now. Um, we also created a PowerPoint, so we are going to try to share it on the screen. Help you. Right. Uh, so while we get everything set up, how is everyone doing so far today? I'm excellent. Pretty good. Good. We are fine. So I oh, wanted to ask well. before we start, uh, mm -hmm. what country are you guys in right now? Because we're in the United States, so how high from the U.S.? <laughs> hi, um, hi, 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 hi. Um, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Nice. Okay, so the PowerPoint isn't working, but we can send it to you later if you would like to email it to everybody. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. Okay, so again, my name is Leah. This is my husband, CJ, or Christian. And, Call me CJ, it's easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> in our presentation today, we called it Heart to Serve, or um, the premise of starting a business while in health. So, um, my background, got you. For today's agenda, we want to talk about our story a little bit because our story is very important in starting a business, um, as well as how you can use that story in order to create your business or to even figure out what your passion and purpose might be um, if you don't know where to start. And then uh, my husband will talk about how to challenge your mindset, especially if you're going from being a doctor, a nurse, or anything else in the healthcare profession, and how to challenge that into uh, becoming an entrepreneur. And then lastly, we're going to uh, give you the reasons why it's important to start a business right now, especially with everything that's happening in the world. Um, it's always good to have both extremes of So, uh, we will start with my story. Um, as many of you probably have when you were little, you probably planned out your entire life. I know I planned out my entire life. I thought I wanted to be a doctor at the age of three. Um, that changed in high school where I decided to become a nurse. So from there, I still planned my life and I thought I would become a nurse. I would work for two years, then go back to school, become a nurse practitioner. And then after that, work for another one or two years, get married, have a child, buy a house, you know, the typical, the typical, uh, I guess, American life plan dream. or American dream. Um, so what ended up happening was very, very different from that plan. So I did graduate um, as a nurse uh, from Mount St. Mary's University here in um, California. I became a pediatric nurse at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. But what happened right after nursing school just threw our life um, completely around. I got pregnant first. Um, I ended up getting pregnant. We ended up getting married after our son turned four months old. Um, and then I ended up getting really sick. I got sick three or four years ago. I was on 20 medications. I was bed rest. Um, I couldn't walk. I was bleeding from random places. So basically it turned my life upside down. I thought I was going to be a nurse forever. Um, and then it went from being that to now being depressed and not knowing what I was going to do with my life. Um, in that process, I realized that the reason I got sick is because as nurses or as healthcare professionals, we take care of everybody else first besides ourselves. And um, that's when my self-care journey really started. Um, that's actually how I created the Serenity Journal and Planner uh, that yesterday was actually our one year anniversary and so i created that journal initially just for myself as a self-care practice for me to write out my gratitudes even though i was sick in bed depressed feeling like my life was over i still changed my perspective into what are the three things that i'm grateful for and then um, after 
that, I realized that I'm in control of my own life and my own health. Even though all the doctors didn't know at the time what was wrong with me, um, they would just add medication after medication. I realized that being a nurse is different from being a patient and I needed to take control of my own destiny essentially. So um, that's how I found holistic health. And that's why I'm passionate now about um, taking or getting rid of the toxins in our life, whether that's the products that we use every day, the makeup, the laundry detergent, all of those different things on top of the toxic mindset of us feeling like we can't do what we really dream of doing and that we have to be stuck on this one path for the rest of our life. And then um, down to just the toxic practices that is going on in the world, the toxic crimes that are um, going around that is being hidden um, beside, behind other agendas. So I try to bring all of that to light so that we can be more informed um because a lot of this is systemic it's just the way that it is here especially in the united states even though we we seem to be the richest country um our health care is not the greatest here and um, i've seen that from being on the nursing side and then being on the patient um being the patient side so i went to see holistic health care which is basically treating the whole mind body and spirit um, and then in that journey, I became a health coach because I was able to wean off my medications slowly with my doctor's approval, of course, um, and with my health coach's help. Um, I weaned off all my medications. I was able to walk again. I was able to drive. Every little thing that we take for granted, I was able to do. And now I appreciate it a hundred times more today. Um, same with the journal and planner that I created in the process. It was because of my mindset of feeling, going from depression to now switching it to gratitude. Um, because of creating that journal, I studied to become a life coach. So I didn't stop at the fact that I was a nurse and I, I had this plan of becoming a nurse practitioner or even a doctor of nursing. I just switched my my practice and went down the coaching route, the health coach, the life coach. There, so now the last coach or consultant I became is a business coach or business consultant because when I created the journal and planner, other nurses at the hospital started having hope and they came up to me and they said, I see that you're creating all these things on the side. Um, when do you have time to do that? Or how do you do that? And to be honest, I invested in a lot of coaches myself, and that's how I learned. Um, but for them, I decided to just help them for free. Like Benedicta was saying, um, when do you do something to help other people just for free, just to volunteer your time? So for a while, my husband and I helped other nurses for a year and a half on how to start their, um, how to turn their passions into profit. So um, that's kind of how our life plan happen um, then after all of that after six years we just had another baby she's four months uh, yesterday or two days ago as well so um, it life is just crazy but it's interesting how our story happens for us and our story is not necessarily only for us we can use that to serve other people so um, that's how I want to transition into how why you can use your story or how you can use it each of our stories are, are, is unique so I'm sure each of you have gone through a life situation or a life challenge where in the moment it was hard but after looking back at it, you realize you went through it to help somebody else, or you went through it to accomplish something else in your life. Um, and I really had to take a look at that because for the longest time I was, I was thinking, wow, I went from being a nurse in the hospital, helping these children, working closely with doctors, to now talking about how toxic some of our laundry detergent is. It was a really um, change. It's a really big shift in my mindset because a nurse is up here in, um, here in America, we look at nurses and doctors up here, and then people talking about, you know, selling things or in, or in business, they're not looked at the same regard as uh, someone in the healthcare professional. So I really had to change that. And uh, my husband will um, talk about how you can challenge your mindset even more. But I wanna um, go further to say that our story is used so that people can know, like, and trust you. 
and you can't really go into the business world or the entrepreneurial world if people don't um, trust you, number one. And the way you can do that is to just be vulnerable. Um, like Benedicta said, again, use your phones and um, turn on the camera and just practice sharing your story. Um, before this, I used to cry every time I said my story because I just remember, I remember I remember being bed rest. I remember bleeding from random places. I remember my son being in the other room and I couldn't hold him because I was so sick. Um, so I used to cry all the time. I, I still get a little bit teary eyed, but now because I practice it so much that I can say it easily, but yet still convey the same message and it still be powerful. And that can be the same for you that whatever challenge you went through, you can make, you can change that challenge into somebody else's blueprint for their life so that they can um, they can see that success and failure is inevitable, but you can help them get to their successes faster and you can help them avoid the failures by sharing your own story. So with that, um, I want to introduce my husband again, CJ. Um, he's going to share his story and how, um, how to go about starting a business while you're still in healthcare. Thank you. Um, so, so, so pretty much my story is kind of like hers in a sense, but mine was more of the educational route. Um, I went into nursing school, but however, I was one of those unfortunate ones that despite all the hard work and all the hours invested into, you know, studying to become a nurse, I actually didn't get into nursing school the first time. Um, and in nursing school, I failed maybe at least two classes. I wasn't able to pass my boards five, you know, four times. I didn't get a hospital job like maybe at least 10 times and that was all in a span of like two or three years so again with this whole mindset i think that's the reason why um, us healthcare professionals are very special people because we have resilience and grit and no matter how much the challenge is we are always we're always able to step in front of the plate and we're always willing to say you know what this is for me, I really wanna do this because my purpose in this life is to help other people. So I was pretty much in the exact same boat as well. It's just that in the educational world, I was just having a really hard time. Um, fast forward, maybe about th uh, three, or, three or four years ago, I was able to transition myself from going to the pediatric world of nursing into a cardiac intensive care unit nurse. So I, I took care of patients that had heart transplants, um, pretty much like the really intense part of uh, cardiac surgical transplants like I, I took care of those and I pretty much did that switch where a lot of my coworkers thought it was impossible for me to switch I was able to do that so in about a year and a half so for me to say that oh um, I was able to switch out of a, a respective field to go into my dream field like to me that's very special and unfortunately two years ago I got attacked by my patient and that resulted in me being like debilitated. I had two spinal surgeries, almost four epidural shots to my back. And I thought to myself, man, everything that I worked so hard for got taken away in an instant. And that really takes a toll into your mindset. Um, the blessing that came along with it was now it, re it made me realize how important it, how important it is it to um, really realize that now in this time of age, it's really scary to only have one income. And by one income, I mean as a nurse. Like, let's say if you're injured right away, it's going to be really hard for you to make that money because now instead of you investing that time to take care of patients, you're you're stuck at home, you know, trying to recover. But yet now, no money's coming in. So that to me is a big risk in terms of what I had to go through uh, financially. So um, I, I mean, I wanted to keep it um, sweet and short because I want to be able to go to the point of the reasons why we wanted to share our information for today. But before I, I transition, I wanted to ask, have you ever heard any of these things before? Uh, money doesn't grow on trees. There's not enough money in the world. Do the things you love and you'll be successful. Failure is a bad thing. Competition is healthy. Saving is the best way to be successful. Like all these, you know, these cute little quotes that you would hear from other people. Well, in this day and age now, the game has changed, severely changed, especially now that COVID-19 really took an impact, especially in the US, everything started to change. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because it's to challenge your mindset. It's to really evolve. Same thing as what uh, one of um, 
I forgot who was that name of that person, but he talks about the evolution where those who evolve will thrive, those who those who don't evolve will die. Like the dinosaurs, you would think that the that the dinosaurs are big mighty creatures, but because of the meteor, they, and for them to not able to evolve, they you know they're extinct. There's a reason why they're extinct. So now this is now going into the human like the human race, where now those who are not willing to evolve, they're going to be the ones that that's going to be extinct per se. So the reason why I would say challenge your mindset is because now it really gives you the perspective to think outside of the box, to be really creative, and then now trying to change in this ever growing like COVID-19 or what's been going on in this world, especially a lot of politics in the U.S. I don't know if, if it's with, with your countries or not, but at least in the U.S., we have seen a lot of corruptions in both parties. So um, I'm not going to go political on this, but I just wanted to say that in terms of you being in the game, you have no choice. You're you're in that game. So it's either you have the choice to beat the game or you're just going to live in it. There is a difference. So I would I truly believe in what uh, Benedictus said. Um, your mindset is everything. I 100,000 percent agree that that is exactly that is exactly right. So um, before I, I wanted to move on. You like you have to be able to think before our parents would say you have to have a, a steady job a finance like a job that really pays you well so that you can be able to live off but it, isn't it weird now that people are now you doing youtube you know just imagine youtube they have a camera they just video camera themselves and then some of them would make hundred thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars and it's like and that's just one month and just imagine that now like everything is moving digitally where uh, Pre-COVID times, we were always trying to social with each other, like hang out with each other. We would always go on, you know, meetings face to face. And then now how everything is now transitioning to like this, where now everything's digital. So that's why, I, like what I'm saying, the game has changed. And it's now your opportunity to now think about in terms of what you as an individual, what you want to do to kind of get out of that game or like to beat that game. And so um from what Benedicta said, it's like you always want a side gig, you want to have a business. I a thousand percent agree with that as well. And here's the reason why. The reason why it's it's really important to follow that niche or the you know to really start a side gig is because again, just in case if you have one one income, but then this income is X, you have another income that will provide you um, financially. If that doesn't get work, then you have another one, you have another one. And the whole point of you is to build passive residual income through all of your, I guess you can say investments. And then now this is where we're, this is where we're going to be talking about um, businesses. For healthcare professionals, doctors, pharmacists, registered nurses, occupational therapists, physical, like all of the therapies in the, in the world, why is it a good idea to start a business for healthcare workers? I would say one is we have the capacity to care for others in a very special way. And I'm talking also to, um, to the, registered nurses. Um, I'm a registered nurse myself, so I'm, I'm going to be speaking in terms of registered nurses, but I can attest that the doctors, physical therapists, all the healthcare providers feel the exact same way. Imagine you are in a 12-hour shift. You're dealing with um, someone who has pretty much been at the bottom of their life in terms of physical health. You know, the fact that we give up our time away from our family and our friends to take care of someone else's family or friend already shows to us that we have that special spirit that the world really needs from us. It's not even, it's not even now just about taking care of those that are in front of us. We have gifts that the world needs. And what better way for us to help each other than the reasons why we went into healthcare, because we have that, we have that compassion. It's, it's not even about passion anymore. It's, it's about the compassion to be a human being, to be a friend or to be a family member. Like that's something like very special. Um, we are very passionate individuals, you know, again, um, because, you know, we're in the healthcare fear field that requires us to go through a lot of extensive training. It, it, it requires us to have a lot of time taken away for us to study the craft or th the practice. And then once we already fulfill that, now we're all, like, now we're able to help other people in terms of what we can offer with our knowledge in terms of taking care of not just the physical aspect of a person, but their mental, their spiritual, their like their social, especially with mental health um, that's been going on. Like,
for us healthcare to possess that type of spirit is honestly the reasons why I feel like we can utilize business or side gigs to our advantage because we have that. We, we understand what it's like to be a servant leader. Obviously, we know the idea of sacrifice. You know, we always put our patients, we put all of our friends and family first before ourselves. And that's why I feel like with healthcare, it we do have kind of that bad stigma within ourselves because sometimes we can always give up 100% of our time for other people, but yet we sometimes neglect our own physical health. And yes, it works both ways as good and bad, but the fact that we have that spirit that we're willing to do whatever it takes to put others first is again, a servant leader. And that's, to me, that's very special. And the last thing is we have a strong sense of resilience and grit. You know, no matter how hard the challenge, no matter how hard the, any situation that comes into us, we're always, we're always sending our ground and we always put 100% into whatever we can do so that we can fix that problem. And to be honest, man, like whoever is, is on this call right now that are healthcare professionals, I'm pretty sure all of you guys are healthcare professionals. I give you all kudos because like it's not easy to do whatever we're doing. And you know, for us to still be in this game of helping other people, it's amazing. And I thank you guys for all of your all of your service in terms of, especially with this COVID-19 problem, I thank you guys all from the bottom of my heart because what we're doing is something very, very special. Now, in terms of being an employee to an entrepreneur, there is a huge difference because now when you're thinking about working for someone else, you have, there's certain things that you have to follow. Same thing that now if you're trying to transition into doing your side gigs, doing business, and then now you're trying to transition to yourself to being able to to becoming an entrepreneur, it's very, very different. So for an employee, there's structure, you know, for us to be a nurse, doctor, pharmacist, um, therapist, whatever, there's a structure. You would have to go to school, pass these exams, go to the next class, pass your exams, go to the next class, and then you pass your boards, get hired, and then boom, you're, you're already um, a pharmacist or you're already whatever you practice. For an entrepreneur, there's no structure. You have to be able to be like very, very creative into trying to create that path for yourself. And for for being an, an entrepreneur, there's a lot of risk. You know, there's there's I call it high risk, low security. And what that means is you're pretty much if you're trying to invest into an entrepreneurship, you have to put a lot of capital down. And I mean, like through all your investments, you have to be really smart about how you, you can handle your financial uh, means of living. So because you're you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to do these high risks sometimes you don't even get those those investments back right away versus an employee where you just have to sacrifice your time as long as you can follow your classes then boom you you have a steady paycheck you have benefits you have all these things but and it's low risk for an entrepreneur it's the exact it's the exact opposite so i want you to really be mindful of that um for an employee there's set work hours you know for in the u.s you only work um, 36 to 48, like, you know, those, those hours in order for you to get a paycheck for an entrepreneur. You have like, you set your own hours, but your own hours is more on quality. You know, sometimes one hour of work can be more productive than 20 hours of work. But sometimes again, uh, no matter how much work is being put into entrepreneurship, again, because of the high risk, it's going to be really hard. Um, sometimes at the beginning to get that money back or that investment back, but at the end of the day, it's this. Employees has a cap on success. You know, because you're an employee and because you're working for someone else, the company has a set limit of how much they can pay you in terms of what you can offer value to the company. For an entrepreneur, because because you're pretty much working for yourself or you have a team around you, you have unlimited potential for success. You could be able to work as much as you want, get as much as you want, that's what I mean about like at the end, it's it's a high risk because high risk, high reward, right? So a lot of people are uncomfortable uncomfortable with that because especially with the time and the effort. But I want you to also think about this in terms of challenging your mindset. If you can build five years properly and you're able to make unlimited, unlimited resources come back to you, is that worth the risk compared to you working 40 years of your life so that you could retire. That's going to be another, you know, thing to really think about because if uh, with that mindset now it, you're really opening to the possibilities of seeing the other side of what an employee does and an entrepreneur. 
So, so this is the reason why we created, um, my wife and I created this all in RN. Um, it's not RN for the registered nurses. It's more, it's more of like a, a silly or a cute little quote by saying right now, because especially with the acronyms RN, uh, we wanted to use it as right now. But at first, because we had a lot of our nursing friends uh, come to us in terms of how they can start their businesses, we wanted to create the RN as kind of like, oh, this is for like this is for me because I'm a registered nurse. But it's actually um, all in right now, and all in meaning by the mentality, like you putting 100% to your goals and efforts, just like the exact same way as you went all in to becoming your um, your practice. Now you're kind of using that same mindset to go all into your entrepreneurship. And and for for this all in RN, the reason why we um, we also created this is because we all went through difficult moments to be who we are as healthcare professionals. We and we grabbed some of this and we grabbed it to our our niches. So for me, um, I did photography um, because I was injured and I was uh, bedridden because of my my spinal injury. Um, I wanted to think about okay, what am I good at? Or what am I willing to learn? And exactly what Benedicta said, you have to be able to be willing to learn. And at first I was like, you know, with all of the things I invested into photography, um, I invested, you know, a couple thousand dollars. And then for me, like at that same time, I, I thought, why am I gonna do this for free if I invested, you know, all these people, like all these equipment so that I could try to make money back. But what I realized is that there's a deeper meaning in doing things for free for now. You want exposure. You want people to know exactly who you are and what you're capable of doing. Once people see your niche or the things that you're good at and people really, really love you for the trait or for the knowledge that you know, then that's when it becomes passion. I truly believe I wasn't passionate about photography. I really was, I really had to think about what could I do to make money because I'm, you know, because I'm disabled. And then once I got good at photography and then I was able to serve clients in terms of printing out the photos that they wanted, and then they really appreciated the art that I've, you know, given to them. That's when it becomes passion. So going off on what Benedicta said, in terms of doing things for free or volunteering, I believe first you have to find what your purpose is, because, you know, just as babies, you know, we don't even know what our passion is. You know, being born into this world, we don't even know what our passion is, but we have this innate feeling that we had we have a purpose. The only thing is, how can you find that purpose? And the, for me, the only way to find your purpose is to serve others, serving others with either uh, religious affairs, volunteering, doing some charity work. Once you're able to have that spirit of giving and you are really invested into like just giving your time for other people, that's when you can start finding out like, oh, through knowledge or through word of mouth with other people that are being successful in their respective field, that's when you can find, maybe I should learn photography, maybe I should learn cooking, maybe I should learn music. Once you get good at it and people start to appreciate you, then it tur I believe it turns into passion. And the more that you do it, that's when you start telling yourself, maybe this is my purpose in life. It's to give whatever my gifts are to, you know, to the world. And for us to, um, you know, for us to follow that model, that's why we created this all in our end. It's to help people be more exposed and to be, and for people to um, start following, like start following what their real purpose is, so that, that that way they can find their passion through it all. Um, uh, we also created this because, you know, again, we're we're healthcare professionals. We know what it's like to serve other people. Now, why not we use our gifts so that we can um, share our talents, you know, to the you know, to your city and to the community as well. Um, so, so pretty much like the reason I'm really, really passionate about like this business thing because especially for two years being disabled, um, having this mindset, challenging your mindset to becoming like a full fledged entrepreneur or you wanting to be for me now becoming a, a motivational speaker so that I could use my voice, I can use our platform to inspire other people knowing that there really is something else out there, not just nursing or not just our healthcare, our healthcare jobs. And I'm not saying to quit your healthcare job, I'm not saying that, but you know, just imagine utilizing another source of income so that you can be able to take care of your friends, your family, the people that you hope to serve. To me, that's that's something very, very special. And I know as healthcare professionals, we have more 
more capabilities to doing whatever we need so that we can help the marketplace grow and flourish. So um, just to end it, uh, for final tips to get inspired towards your entrepreneurial journey, um, just we suggest to always be around people that will inspire you. Um, when I first started, I was very lonely in this journey because not a lot of my um, nursing friends were in this type of field. They, they were focused in their nursing, their nursing hours, um, all our issues in the hospital, but outside of the hospital, everybody had their own lives and no one was doing business. So I, we suggest that you hang out with or you spend time with um, people who are following you in this journey as well. Um, we also suggest for you to read books on personal development um, so that you can learn and grow more every single day, um, even just 10 pages a day. That's all it takes for you to learn something new. Um, here in America, we have um, something called um, podcasts. I'm not sure if that's the same um, in other countries, but even listening to podcasts for 10 minutes or YouTube for 10 minutes. Um, and then, okay. and then um, for, for another thing, if you really want to understand like the game of business, or if you really want to understand how to, you know, pitch or how to, you know, share share your brand out there, really watch this um, TV show called Shark Tank. I don't know if you guys heard of that show, but they talk. But it pretty much what that is is they would show a lot of entrepreneurs that would that would pitch to um, the I call it angel investors. Um, they would, you know, pretty much say like, oh, this is our product. This is what we believe in. If you can help support us, like. Somewhere along the road, when you do become um, really good at what you do, and then now you're going to be charging other people, you want to be able to understand now the game of business. So uh, what better way to, you know, to binge watch, especially now with COVID happening, than Shark Tank. So Shark Tank is another great one. And lastly, practice and practice your craft. You know, they say practice is perfect. I don't, that to me, that's not true. Like, there's no such thing as perfect because we're not, uh, we're not perfect human beings, but practice does make precise. The more that you practice, uh, you could be able to um, adjust whatever you need to do or, um, you know, just pretty much change your environment so quick that, you know, you've done this multiple, multiple times that now you could handle any objections or situations that come along your way. So um, at the end of the day, it's like um, the best way also um, lastly, in terms of you going into this entrepreneurship journey is have a mentor. You know, um, we have done it. If you really want us to help mentor you so that you could be able to find out what your niche is and, you know, use that to help your marketplace or help the people around you, definitely give us um, definitely give us a heads up because we have we have gone through that. We have invested a lot of um, resources so that we can be able to have the knowledge that we can bring to you right now. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, we're, and we're all in this together, you know, as healthcare professionals, um, you know, we're like family, you know, especially since you guys are all in a different country, we, we still consider you as family because, you know, we all have our kindred spirits. We all have the capacity to learn and we all have the capacity to care. And for that, every each and every one of you that's on this call right now are very special people and now the thing that i want to challenge you is to realize that you are a lot more worth than what the companies are paying you for your job all you have to do is just really believe in yourself and really find the right people to uplift your spirits and lift your passion because the world needs us more than ever not just in the hospital but now in the world especially now that COVID-19 is going on, we we need you. One way or the other, shape, shape or form, we, we need you. And we need your talents, we need your gifts, because that is what keeps us inspired. That's what keeps us living every single day, so. Thank you so much. Thank you for having <clears throat> us. And um, yeah, with that, if yeah. you would like the PowerPoint that we yeah. created, uh, we can have it uh, emailed as well. But yeah. thank you again for having yeah. us. Uh, before we leave, do you guys have any other questions that you wanted to ask us in terms of what we shared with you guys today? Everything's good. It's a good time to ask questions. Right, and I just uh, I just dropped um, in the chat box 
okay, you know, um, um, Kristen was mentioning about earlier the, the business that they have to, you know, coach and all of that on, on, on starting and running the business, even for people that are, of course, health professionals. So the link is on the group. If you need to reach out to them later after now, it's fine. So I've got the link on the group, so uh, on, on the chat box. So you can, of course, reach out, go to the link and then communicate to them thereafter. It's going to be amazing for you to do that. All right, so we have questions now. Why was it? It's been very, very insightful listening to um, both Kristen and Leah. Leah, thank you so much. Kristen, thank you so much for the session. But now we have questions, so we'll do that in just a few minutes. So if you want to ask questions, you can kindly unmute your mic so you can quickly ask that question right now. We also placed our email address because sometimes that link doesn't work. So you can email us as well. Okay. If you either like the PowerPoint Great. or the um, application. Great. 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 Awesome. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So let's get our questions. One or two persons to just, okay, unmute your mic and quickly ask your question now as we start to round up the webinar today. So do we have um, administrators, do we have anyone trying to um, mute their mic so we'll know if there's a question or not? All right, I, I, I can't see anyone from here, so I believe that, you know, the information was prompt. Excellent, well, okay, and I, once again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you so much, Christian. I'm going to be reaching out to you daily after this session to converse with you on a few things. Thank you so much for the session. It was educating and time in, 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 you know, starting business. Of, of course, you just don't want to say, this is what I do a lot. I'm just a, I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse, and all of that. Okay, you can start to inculcate things, bring things into 